Hey, my name is Roy, and uh, I'm one of the pastors at North Star Church. Uh, which pastor I am right now uh, depends on what week it is. <laughs> I recently moved from being the pastor of our Callaway campus, uh, which I love because, you know, I get to see my Callaway campus friends all the time, to being the pastor of our beach campus, uh, which I love because I get to see all of my beach campus friends all the time now, except today, of course, when I'm teaching to, you know, all the campuses. So today I don't get to see my beach friends or my Callaway friends. But I do get to see my Panama City campus friends, which, of course, I love. But I told our beach campus my first Sunday there, hey, I'm going to be your campus pastor for the next 30 days. Because right now, our church only makes plans for 30 days at a time. And then if the world doesn't end in 30 days, then we'll decide you know, what we're going to do next for the next 30 days. Uh, and this level of unprecedented uncertainty, it's something we're all facing in all of our lives right now, right? We're in a season of constant change. I mean, with COVID-19, things sometimes change by the hour. Now we're doing it this way. Wait, now we're doing it that way. Now this is the problem. No, 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 now this is the problem. That is the problem. And in these days and months ahead, hey, things are going to be changing, sometimes by the hour. And that uncertainty, well, it puts stress and pressure on all of us. It, it's kind of like this. COVID hit, and while I was trapped in my house learning to Zoom everybody, they made a lot of progress on the flyover from the Hathaway Bridge. Apparently those construction guys, they can get a lot more done on Zoom than I can. Uh, but when I finally peeked out of my house and you know drove over the Hathaway Bridge from the beach to Callaway, uh, which I used to do so much that my car drove itself, and I don't remember what my brain was doing when my body said, hey, what is this? That wasn't there before. I mean, this isn't right. I don't know what to do. Thank you, Kathy Harris and others that worked to make this possible. Hey, you made my drive safer. You made my drive faster and more efficient, but you're stressing me out. And, and this is all of our lives right now. In fact, if we're honest with COVID-19, probably this is more accurate uh, as a picture of our lives right now. And because we're all under this pressure, we are continuing a series here that Marty began last week from the book of James, entitled, Faith That Works When the Pressure Is On. Now, if you didn't see last week's sermon, be sure and watch it at Northstar.Church, because we're going to walk verse by verse through this letter that the brother of Jesus wrote to people who were like us under a great deal of pressure. And I want to warn you, you should not believe anything I say today. Because I'm going to ask you to believe some things that are so radical and require such a dramatic shift in your life that you would be crazy to do them just because I said so. So I want you to be you know, able to examine what I say today and see where it is in the scriptures and to be able to talk with other reasonable people about it. So I'd like to send you my notes for you to follow along and take your own notes. You could jot down your own questions. Uh, so I'd like to invite you to text uh, the word CONNECT to this number. Just take out your phone. If you're watching on our online campus, one of our physical uh, locations, go ahead and text CONNECT to this number. And we will send you a link. And you just click the link, you'll be able to see the notes on your phone. You'll be able to take your own notes and let us know how to pray for you as well. And at the end of the service, just hit submit. Copy of your notes is going to be emailed to you automatically. Now, there's also a place for you to let us know if you're joining us for the first time. And if you're joining us for the first time, hey, welcome. And you can also share your prayer request uh, through the connection card. So go ahead, text connect to this number. And we're going to pick up where Pastor Marty left off last week in James 1.5 where he says, If you need wisdom, ask our generous God and he'll give it to you. He will not rebuke you for asking. Now you may be aware that when Jesus' brother James first wrote this letter, he wrote it in the Greek language. So this word that we translate wisdom, uh, it means literally the skill or ability needed to form the best plans and accomplish them through the best means. And that's our bottom line today. Here's the question. How can I form the best plans and accomplish them through the best means? Maybe you want to jot this down. James says, and he will give it to you. He will not rebuke you. He is just waiting to show you the best plans and the best way to accomplish them. You know, every time you fail to see the best plan or how to accomplish the plan, it's because you did something to create a barrier between God sending the wisdom and you receiving it. Because God is just dying to give you his wisdom. So another way to ask the bottom line today is what is keeping me from the best plans and accomplishing them through the best means? 
So we're going to look at the three choices that James says that we need to make and the barriers that would keep us from getting the wisdom that God wants to give us. So here's what he says about how we can accomplish the best plans through the best means. Number one, he says, see the wisdom, reject arrogance. The barrier here is my own arrogance. See, he says, if you need wisdom, you can ask God. He's generous. He'll give it to you. He won't rebuke you for asking. Why do you need wisdom? Well, if you read through the book of Proverbs, it'll give you about 30 practical benefits of wisdom. But let me give you just one this morning. This is in Proverbs uh, 3.18. It says, those who become wise will be happy. Wisdom is the key to a blessed life. Anybody want to sign up for a happy, blessed life in the middle of a global pandemic? See, the problem is, I can tell you all day that you need to pray. That when you work, you work. When you pray, God works. I can tell you that you can accomplish more in an hour of prayer than you can in an hour of work. But if you don't see how much you desperately need God's wisdom, your prayer life is going to be really short-lived. Studies show that if you genuinely see the need, in most instances, you can actually do about twice as much as you think you can. For example, if you think uh, that you can run you know, about one mile, you can probably run two miles if a bear is chasing you. See, if you really, really know how much you need to do something, you can probably do more. You really need God's word. You are one seemingly small bad choice from destroying your life and the life of those you love. Bob Ebling was a NASA engineer on the 1986 Space Shuttle Challenger launch, and he warned that they shouldn't launch because he believed it was too cold and there was an O-ring at risk of failure. But statistically, there's about 1 in 100,000 chance of it failing, so the decision to launch was made, and watch what happened. Liftoff of the 25th Space Shuttle mission, and it has cleared the tower. To my knowledge, I was the only one that called it in. Man, uh, that was tragic. And this tragedy was a result of one decision about an O-ring that seemed to be a reasonable risk. But it cost $196 billion and seven people their lives. Do you have the wisdom you need to make the tough choices that you're facing about how to respond to our current global crisis, about the future of your employment, about how your kids are going to be educated? One wrong choice could radically change your life. Do you see how desperately that you need God's wisdom, or do you believe you can figure it out on your own? I'd like to give you a little time right now to pray that God would help you to see how much you need his wisdom. So if you're with someone in your home, online, or wherever you're watching, or in one of our physical campuses, would you turn to a person near you and pray together if you feel comfortable, or if you'd rather pray alone, but would you now bow your head and pray for wisdom? Man, I need wisdom, and I hope you're able to form, we're able to form the best plans and accomplish them through the best means. But to do that, we'll need, number one, to see our need for wisdom. And then number two, ask God for wisdom to reject apathy. That's the barrier here. You have to reject apathy. See, it says, if you need wisdom, ask our generous God. So you don't get true wisdom, you don't get the skill or ability you need to form the best plans and accomplish them through the best means just by going to school or reading book or listening to podcasts or asking people or hiring coaches or doing self-help YouTube videos. Man, those are helpful. They're not enough. At some point, you have to ask God. In chapter 4 of the book of James, he says, you don't have because you didn't ask God. And that certainly applies to wisdom. Wisdom, it's not automatic. Even for a follower of Jesus, wisdom is not a fruit of the Spirit. 
So please don't miss this. Prayer is the only way to get God's wisdom. If you do not ask God for wisdom, you will not have God's wisdom. And wisdom is available for everybody. Like there's not some people who are born wise and some who are not. He says, if you need wisdom and ask our generous God, he will give it to you. He will not rebuke you for asking. See, some of you, you, you've heard me talk maybe about my goal to wake up and be consciously aware of God's presence and every time my circumstances change from one thing to the other to remind myself of his presence and to ask his help you know, with whatever the next thing is. And I've tried day after day for more than 25 years. Day after day, I've failed. I've never gone a whole day with a conscious awareness of Jesus with me asking his help in every new circumstances. Never. Closest I've gotten, though, is since I've tried in every circumstance to simply ask God, give me your wisdom as I sing these songs to you with my friends. God, give me your wisdom as I preach this sermon. God, give me your wisdom after this sermon. I'm going to forget and I'm going to hug somebody because I am not a natural social distancer. I want to challenge you to take this challenge, to ask for wisdom every time you do a new thing. And if you fail, you will. But if you succeed, please don't tell me because I'll be depressed that you're so much better than me. I, I know, I got issues. But listen, the more you succeed in asking God for wisdom, the more you'll receive it. So if you're willing to take this challenge, I want to ask you to write the phrase, ask God for wisdom, in the prayer request section of your connection card. Go ahead, do that now, because I'd love to pray for you this week, and I will. And while you're doing that, I'd like to mention that in in just a few verses in the book of James, he's going to mention that after you ask, God gives you wisdom primarily through his word. You need to be listening to God through his word. And so we're going to get to that in a couple weeks. But for now, I'd like you, would you imagine that the skill and the ability that you need to form the best plans and accomplish them through the best means is available to you always in every situation if you ask for it. It is available to you, but even though it's available to you, listen, you might not be able to receive it, which leads us to the third choice we need to make to get God's wisdom. Number three is embrace God's best, reject your agenda. That's the the, the barrier. This choice is the most difficult because most of us refuse because we don't want to reject our agenda. See, the problem is that we love what we want so much that we lose what is best. You may want to jot that down in your notes on your phone. We love what we want so much that we lose what is best. Here's how James describes it. But when you ask him, be sure that your faith is in God alone. When you ask him for wisdom, when you ask him to show you these best plans and how to accomplish them, he says, be sure, be sure that your faith is in him alone. Now, what does that mean, your faith being in God alone? Well, James continues, in the New American Standard Translation, it says it this way, but he must ask in faith without any doubting, for the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind, for that man ought not to expect that he will receive anything from the Lord. Not anything. Man, that's pretty dramatic, right? I had a close friend in New York who had a family member who contracted the coronavirus. And my friend prayed that God would heal him. And their family member died. What went wrong? Like this verse seems to say that they must have doubted that God would heal them. And if you read this verse, like isolated out of its context, it does seem to say if you pray for somebody to be healed, but you have any doubt that God will heal them, then you shouldn't respect to receive anything from God. Does this mean that it, you know, if you pray to get hired for a job or pray that your car won't break down or pray that your relationship will be healed and you have any doubt at all, you're not 100% certain that God will do that specific thing, then you shouldn't expect to receive anything from the Lord? Well, like, it kind of seems that way, doesn't it? But if you read this verse in its context... It means almost the opposite. See, James is not talking about people you know, paying their mortgage or keeping their jobs or being healed. In fact, he's talking to people who have lost their homes and their jobs and have been forced out of their towns and cities, many who are now refugees and have lost like everything. And he says, in your trials, ask God for something. And in this case, not that your trials will go away. You know, There's nothing wrong with that. But in this case, he's telling them that in their trials, they should ask God for wisdom, for the skill and ability to form the best plans and accomplish them through the best means while they're sick or unemployed or homeless or estranged from their spouse or friend and he'll give them wisdom unless 
And now let's read this in its context of asking for wisdom in our trials. He said, but when you ask him, be sure that your faith is in God alone. Do not waver for a person with divided loyalty is as unsettled as a wave in the sea that is blown back and forth in the wind. So I'd like to draw your attention to that phrase, divided loyalty. Such people, right, should not receive anything from the Lord because they're divided between God alone and what they think God should do in a particular instance. Such people should not expect anything from the Lord. Why? Their loyalty is divided between God and what? Between God and the world. Let me give you an example. Um, in Psalm 91.3, this is very popular in pandemics, he says, he will rescue you from every trap and protect you from every disease. Now, does that include the coronavirus? Of course. Did God promise to protect you from the coronavirus? Absolutely, but not necessarily in this world. See, when we limit our understanding of God's wisdom and love to what what we want him to do in this world, our loyalty becomes divided between him and the world, and we should not expect to receive any of his wisdom. And we become very frustrated and confused. My father was a missionary to Mali, West Africa, and he got cancer. And we prayed that God would heal him. And God healed my dad. And he and my mom went to Haiti then to serve the people there. And my dad got a different kind of cancer. And the doctors gave my dad six months to live. And we prayed, again, that God would heal him. And he died three and a half years later. And I remember like being so frustrated and angry. Why would God heal my dad from cancer and then let him die from cancer? If my dad were alive, like he'd just be out somewhere in the world where nobody else would go probably, helping people in need. And the more I tried to figure it out, man, the more frustrated and angry I became. You know, back in the 80s, uh, atheistic philosophers used this line of reasoning to argue against the existence of an all-powerful, all-loving God. And the argument was if God allowed senseless suffering, like I'm describing, then it was either because he was not powerful enough to stop it, or he didn't care enough to stop it. But according to Tim Keller, this argument is no longer accepted even among secular philosophers. Because, see, it assumes that it would be impossible for God to have a reason for what we call senseless tragedy just because we aren't able to understand that reason. In the last few years, even secular philosophers acknowledge the possibility of the existence of things we don't have a capacity to understand. And I can still remember the place I was in my apartment in New York when I read these words. Oh, how great are God's riches and wisdom and knowledge. How impossible it is for us to understand his decisions and his ways. Romans 11.33. I can remember as if it was this morning asking God while I was going up in an elevator in my apartment building, God, why didn't you heal my dad? And I sense God asked me just as clearly as if I heard an audible voice, But didn't the doctors give him six months to live? And didn't he live for three and a half months, years? I did heal him. I held him for three years, and then I healed him forever. See, my agenda of how I wanted God to work made it impossible for me to receive his wisdom because my faith was in God keeping my dad in this world instead of being in God alone. And he, that left me unstable. And that's what James said would happen. He said that they are unstable in everything that they do. Man, I don't want to be that way. And what does that mean for your time in this world? Like, don't we say that if Jesus is at the center of your life, your life will be better? I mean, is that just after I die? Do I live the same miserable life as people without God and then everything's better after I die? What can I expect from God in this world? Well, let's answer that question now. It says in Timothy, so as long as we are clothed and fed, we should be happy. And the we here refers to followers of Jesus. So if you're a follower of Jesus, you can expect in this world food and clothes. And if you have food and clothes and Jesus, that's enough to be happy. Because Jesus is what makes your life better. Your faith in God alone. If you want God's wisdom, he wants to give it to you, but only if you let him run the universe. See, this passage is not about doubting that God would heal somebody or keeping any other part of your agenda. It's about doubting if God will do what's best. It's about doubting God himself. Do you believe God can be trusted even when you don't understand what he does or allows? 
What James is saying is what we need to do to receive the wisdom of God is, is what is often referred to as surrendering to God's will. But I'm not sure I like that word picture. And I couldn't find anywhere in the Bible where it actually says we should surrender to God. And because I love and trust God, I prefer the idea of embracing the will of God. I prefer this. Did you watch this? Hey, Roy. Hey, I had some tenants just move out of our rental property. Do you mind coming over and uh, helping clean up a little bit before the next tenants move in? Dude, you come here so much. I, I would love to do that. Oh, I appreciate it. We'll head out in a little bit. Okay, cool. All right. I think that's a much more accurate picture of why I should do whatever God asks than this is. Roy, I need you to come over and help me with the rental property because tenants just moved out. Uh, yeah, yeah. Out we go. Oh, man. <laughs> of course it was kind of weird. Hey, let's hear it for that Academy Award level acting. No? Okay. All right. I get it. Hey, when James says, if you need wisdom, ask our generous God and he'll give it to you. He won't rebuke you for asking. This word, we translate generous, it means sincere, single-minded, without duplicity, bountifully, liberally. See, the God who wants to give you wisdom has one single-minded purpose, which is to glorify himself by expressing his love and grace by doing good for you. And he'll give you that wisdom. Not if you wait to see what he says so you can decide if you're going to do it, but if you put your faith in him alone. So what can you expect when you put your faith in God alone? Food, clothing, and Jesus. But the real shocker, the breathtakingly wondrous part of this deal is what comes with Jesus. Like joy. In Philippians it says, whatever happens, my dear brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. See, no matter what happens, right? Even if things don't work out like you expected, you can still rejoice. How? Well, in the Lord, because that's where true lasting joy is found. Jesus said in John 10.10, 10, My purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. Do you, do you really need for God to run the universe according to your agenda and timetable if you end up with a rich and satisfying life? And I'm not saying like it'll be instant, but there are seasons of waiting on the Lord, yes. But a life with Jesus at the center is always better because it's ultimately rich and satisfying. So, Let's say, for example, you ask God for wisdom, and you believe he led you to use your stimulus check to help you purchase a used car. Well, what if it turned out to be a lemon, and now you've lost your money, and you still have no transportation? What happened to a rich and satisfying life then? Well, what happened is we think that what we need to happen, what we want to happen for us, has to happen for us to experience that life. And it's not true. Because God doesn't want our joy to be dependent on a car that runs or money that's in the bank. He wants for us a rich and satisfying life when we experience our faith in God alone. You know, these are the exact same issues that James' readers were facing. So he made it crystal clear when he says, Believers who are poor have something to boast about. For God has honored them, and those who are rich should boast that God has humbled them. That's James 1, 9, and 10. Every time that God allows some trouble or loss that shows us how uncertain and unsatisfying our worldly, rich, worldly riches are, we should boast. We should boast in that loss because it causes us to rely not on ourselves or our resources, but God who loves us. Oh, and by the way, who raises the dead, right? You're facing, you're going to face in the coming months more tough decisions probably than you've ever faced before. You've never needed, I've never needed God's wisdom more than right now. And he is waiting. He delights in generously giving us that wisdom. If we will, one, see we need the wisdom. Reject our arrogance. Two, ask God for wisdom. Reject our apathy. And then embrace God's best by rejecting our agenda. You know, would you begin to ask God for wisdom today in every circumstance? Would you say to God, I don't need my way. I embrace your way. I don't need to get what I want because I believe that what I want really is you. Can we pray together? If you would, wherever you are, uh, if you would bow your head and close your eyes if you're able, in all of our physical campuses, uh, wherever you are in our online campus. And um, I want to ask you just in an attitude of prayer, just listening to God, connected with God right now uh, while I'm speaking to you. Um, would you would you ask God to speak to you? 
um, you know, we, we are all going to face tragic circumstances. We live in a broken world and there are going to be things that happen are just that just tear our hearts out. And we're not going to understand some of those things. Like we're, we're going to just be broken and, and grieving and just we're not going to have the answer. We're not going to know what the reason is because God could have stopped it. But God didn't stop it. And although we don't know what the reason is, we can know what the reason is not. We can know that the reason is not ever that God doesn't care, that he doesn't feel or care about our suffering. And the reason we can know that with certainty is because the Bible tells us that he did not spare even his own son, but he gave him up to death for us. That doesn't sound like somebody who doesn't care. It says that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Can you imagine that? And maybe you're here today. And maybe you want to experience the, the rich, satisfying life that is not connected to your circumstances or difficult, but is rooted in a real and personal and vibrant moment-by-moment -moment relationship with Jesus. There's a way for you to do that. The Bible says that our sin that Jesus died for, that we all have sinned. Because every one of us, we have at one point gone our own way. We have disregarded what we knew to be right. And we did what we wanted. And that is sin. And that separates from a God who is perfect and holy and a righteous judge. And he has to punish that sin if he is a righteous judge. And he is. But he is also a loving father. And so he cared so much that he sent his son, Jesus. And on the cross, over 2,000 years ago, Jesus died because the penalty for sin is death. And he took in his body all of the punishment that every one of us deserve. And he died in our place. And then he rose from the dead. And now he offers us forgiveness and a relationship with him and with the Father. And if you have never received his forgiveness for your sin, I would like to give you that opportunity right now. Just where, wherever you are in one of our campuses or online or wherever you're listening to my voice, if you want to begin a relationship with God and experience his forgiveness, would you just pray a prayer something like this? Um, just repeat these words in your mind to God if they genuinely express your heart. Say, God, I know I've done wrong. I know I've separated myself from you by my sin. And I believe that I should be punished for my sin. But I believe Jesus took my punishment. So by faith, I trust you. I receive your forgiveness. Help me now to follow you. And with all of your heads still bowed and eyes closed, if you just prayed that prayer, um, in all of our campuses, would you just raise your hand? Just raise your hand to your campus pastor so I can see, so we can pray for you. If you're online, you can, there should be a little hand icon that you could click there. And so just, you're raising your hand before God to say, God, I want you. I want to follow you. I want your forgiveness. And thank you so much, all of you. Thank you so much. You can put your hands down with your head bowed and your eyes still closed. I believe that there are people right now listening to my voice and you're facing something or you have faced something that you just don't have an answer for and you are so you are struggling to turn away from God because you can't understand what he allowed in your life today i want to give you the opportunity maybe not understanding everything but with the faith that you have to embrace God and his will to say God i trust you enough to receive your life in my life help me to follow you if you if you today want to take that stand to say i will embrace god's will no matter how much it hurts or how difficult it is or confusing it might be i want to stand in that grace then i'd like you to do this wherever you are i'd like to ask you to stand just to physically stand. Maybe you're in your home right now. Maybe you're in one of our campuses. Maybe you're somewhere off by yourself. Would you just stand? And in standing, say to God, I will not fight you. These things are bad. And
and they're unexplainable. But I want your life. I want your grace. I want your joy, regardless of what happens to me in this world. Would you just do that right now? Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Let me lead us in prayer. God, I know it's hard. And when we suffer and know that you could have stopped the suffering, it feels like you don't care. But Jesus is proof that you do care. And we just don't understand. So God, help our faith. Grow our faith. Help us to see the good that you're bringing through every circumstance that we encounter. In Jesus' name, amen. You can all be seated. Thank you. And thank you for joining us today in our service. And I want to encourage you to go ahead and hit submit uh, on your connection card and your notes. So um, give us a prayer request maybe or, or record one of these decisions that you made to begin to ask God for wisdom or to stand uh, in, in His embracing His will. We would love to pray for you this week. God bless you.